Finance Podcast. And I'm super excited about today. We have an amazing friend of mine who will be speaking to us in just a minute. I'll introduce him in just a second. But before we do get into the content for today, let me just say, um, I just got back from an amazing gathering with a bunch of leaders from Catch the Fire. Now, those of you who know Leaders Alliance know that we are a, a branch of Catch the Fire Ministries that really started about 28 years ago with a an amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Toronto. And out of that outpouring, they went into 12 years of nightly meetings, six nights a week, and literally hundreds and millions of people were impacted over that period of time. In fact, they estimate about three and a half million people visited Toronto over that course of that time. And from that, many other ministries and churches were launched. And so we have, uh, gosh, that what's called the Revival Alliance which is about a dozen different ministries that are now affecting all over the planet, including Iris Ministries, which has over 8,000 churches, Leif Etland, who's led over 500,000 Pakistanis to Christ. We have Bethel and so forth. All these different movements were impacted. And uh, my wife and I were also impacted when we were pastoring a vineyard church in San Francisco. Um, and our church had become one of the largest churches the city had seen in a generation. And when we heard that God was moving in Toronto with a little vineyard church located up there, we dropped everything. We went up and got touched by God and, and, uh, We've never been the same. But uh, then through the process of years, we pastored in San Francisco for 33 years and ultimately moved to Redding, California, where now uh, we actually lead pastorscoach.com, an amazing ministry that's about to launch our new uh, boot camp in two weeks. So if you're interested in the boot camp, please check out pastorscoach.com. And uh, but today, we have a very special guest. Happy Lehman is going to be joining us. Happy is, uh, he was on the board of Vineyard for, gosh, probably more like 30 years. And he was an amazing pastor who raised up a powerful church in, in the Chicago area of uh, Illinois. But he also was one of the principal leaders helping to guide the movement over the years. So he has he had a ringside seat in terms of all the stages of development that John Wimber went through as he was developing the vineyard movement. And so what we're going to do is explore some of those things. We're going to do a deep dive into Wimber himself, what he taught, what his passions were, uh, some of the amazing success that he had and some of the challenges that he faced. We're also going to talk about the movement as a whole and how they went forward from that time. And so this is going to be incredibly instructive as we look into one of the most pivotal movements in our generation. So uh, Happy, would you come on board and, and uh, I'm going to have you introduce yourself a little bit. Oh, it's so good to see you. And uh, I'm super excited to have you on today's uh, podcast. So well, thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. You and I have known each other about 30 years, and um, we have kindred spirits. And uh, I've just always enjoyed talking with you. You're one of the better thinkers I find in the Christian movement, and I love to think through things. So, well, I'm so glad you, you uh, agreed to come on. And so uh, I'd like you just to get started with just sharing a little bit about who you are, even prior to coming into the Vineyard Movement. Let's start there. Yeah, I probably have a story that... Um, I ought to write a book on it's incredible. I grew up in a farm on a farm in a group that was Amish with cars. We weren't Amish, but we did everything they did except we had cars and electricity. My mom hated that statement, but I grew up hating Christianity. I didn't want to do it. My dad was a lay pastor, a farmer. And uh, I was at 18. I'm leaving to go to the University of Illinois. It is um, a big school at that time. Thought I could run away from God. Dad said, I don't have any money to help you. Here's a Bible. He writes in the front of the Bible, Matthew 6, 33, he said, this verse will help you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be added. And I, oh, I don't know about that, but I kept the Bible. I still have it today. Go to school. I'm living a terrible life. I'm pretty much just going to get away from God. I meet this beautiful girl named Diane. We start dating and um, I tell her three things. I'm really interested in you, but I'm never farming. I'm never going to be a Christian, and I'm never going to pastor should I become a Christian. She agreed. We got married. One month later, she reneges. And, <laughs> oh, good Lord. She wants to be a Christian. I thought, this is impossible. I thought, well, I don't want to go to hell. I'll join. But I was a, a pretty worthless Christian. It just wasn't working. 
Uh, and we went to church, but I didn't, my heart wasn't in it. And then um, her, her maiden name is Hare, like a rabbit, H-A-R-E. It, okay. It's spelled a little different than that. But uh, her family is known for being very fertile and very productive. Well, she couldn't have any kids. Mm-hmm. Or we couldn't have any kids. And so no. we tried doctors and everything. And, um, one day I, I heard I was driving in the car. I was a salesperson mm-hmm. driving the car. The Lord said, you're going to get bad news at your last doctor report, but don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Went home, told my wife that God spoke to me. He said, yeah, right. You're lukewarm as could be. God would never <laughs> speak to you. We went to the doctor in Chicago area. By the way, Champaign is where I live. And we're an hour and a half, two and a half hours south. So um, not quite Chicago, but it feels like it at times. Um, we go up there. He gives a bad report. My wife looks at me and said, you must heard from God. What do we do? Within a week, we met the Holy Spirit. Yeah, through a whole bunch of experiences. We, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. I was like those guys in Acts 19. I didn't, I'd didn't. i heard about it. I'd been told to stay away from it, but I didn't know it was real. didn't know it was acting. We get filled with the Spirit. We go around asking churches to pray for us. Nobody will pray for us. They'll say, if it be God's will, we'll pray for you. We said, wait a minute. We know it's God's will. Every barren woman in the Bible had a, a, a son. Uh, there's eight of them, and they all had sons. We said, we're going to have a baby boy. And sure enough, we prayed for ourselves, and uh, it's a long story, way too long for you, but we did get pregnant. Um, so excited me, I figured I had broken the bank. First John, or First John 5, 14, and 15 says, this is the confidence we have that if we ask anything, we know he hears us. If he hears us, then we know we have the petitions we've asked. I thought, wow, wow. if I can get a kid, I can get anything. Yeah. We, we went back to town. We said, hey, nobody knows how good God is. Let's start a church and tell them. Actually, not a church, just kind of a Bible teaching. And um, started our home. 30 people show up first night. It grew quickly. It was back in the 70s, of course. People were looking for teaching. And it eventually developed into a church. Uh, The church grew to like 3,000 with six multi sites for a while. It had... um, uh, by the way, I have an MBA in finance. It was not my life dream to have a church. And I just didn't want to do it. But eventually, the other pastors around town called me and said, if you're going to teach our people, start a church. Because we don't, don't send them back here. So we started a church. It grew. We ended up having five kids. We now have 19 grandkids. Wow. And I think you have a lot of kids yourself. But, wow. um, but it has just been a delightful journey. We were lost as could be. We started this church. Can you imagine an MBA starting a church? I have no Bible background. Uh, I don't know anything. And we were getting very legalistic. We meet the vineyard through a magazine. Oh. I don't know if you you remember the magazine that was MC 510, Can It Change Your Life? And a magazine doesn't even exist anymore, Christian Life. Right. So, and we got invited to a vineyard meeting, and the rest is history. Wow. So that's how I got into the vineyard. It's a strange story. I don't belong there in some ways. And yet God in his grace plucked me out of uh, obscurity. In fact, I've always thought one of John Wimbert's secrets was that he didn't know anything writing for the righteous brothers living ungodly. And then God saves him and trains him. In some ways I was a blank slate. Wow. But I always felt a little odd because I didn't have any Bible degrees and people kind of looked at me a little strange. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So, um, so your first exposure then was the MC 510 conference. Was that correct? In 84? Uh, my wife read that magazine article and a guy named Blaine Cook, who you obviously know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, she calls, uh, she looks up your Belinda, like what kind of name is your Belinda gets the name of the church. Blaine answers the phone and invites us to a pastor's conference. And this is really significant because at the pastor's conference, Two things happened. First of all, we've been charismatic because of the babies. And we were in a faith movement for a while. Yeah. Um, we go there and we saw so much Holy Spirit ministry by everybody that my wife freaks out. We'd seen Holy Spirit ministry. We'd seen people slain the Spirit. But this was all over the room. Right. Uh, lay people were standing up calling out words. People were falling, crying, sobbing. My wife goes back to the uh, hotel room and says, we're leaving. These people are weird. I said, no, we're not. I had never been to California at that time. Uh, and uh, and I said, I paid to come to California. I'm staying all week. 
but the thing that Wimber taught that changed my life and I became a disciple in is the five-year plan. He taught yes. writing your history in advance. Yes. Well, that stunned me because he's the only human being I ever met in the Christian world that said, Holy mm -hmm. Spirit ministry has to balance with Holy Spirit planning. Well, that electrified the MBA in me. Yes. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is going to work. I see now why God called me. He wants me to think. And uh, it was interesting. We came home from the conference, and my wife said, how would you like that conference? I, oh, that was a good conference. And two weeks later, she said, well, what have you done about that conference? I said, nothing. <laughs> she said, you get in the office, and you apply what he said. And he wants you to start with your values, your your purpose, your priorities, your practices, right. all that stuff. Right. I then wrote, right behind me is still about that many notebooks, about eight inches of notebooks full of my five-year plans. And I think it's one of the secrets um, that the early vineyard had that we don't use anymore. That's uh, right. If well, anybody's interested in that, get the book called Doing Church by Alexander Venter, Venter, V-E-N-T-E-R, South African guy who interned for Wimber and wrote it all in a book and did an outstanding job. That sounds so good. Now, um, obviously, the reason I wanted you to be on our podcast was to really share your unique vantage point as one of the board members for the movement uh, for a significant period. And um, you have certain insights, certain perspectives that very few people have. You know, I was involved as a, a district overseer, so I was in what was called the Council of the Vineyard. But I didn't have the same uh, access, the same closeness that you had to the inner workings of things. But I did have a similar first experience. I mean, when we first in 1984, well, I first met John Wimber when he was traveling with Lonnie Frisbee in, in, in uh, Santa Cruz in the, at the end of 83. And he invited us to this conference, the big first MC510 big conference. And yeah. um, I went and Diane had the same reaction as your Diane. It's like, oh, we got to get out of here. This is weird. And she says, if this doesn't happen in San Francisco when we go back, I'm just going to say forget it on the whole thing. And literally, as soon as we went back, God started moving in a similar way. And so we knew an impartation had taken place. And uh, but but I also like to say of Wimber that he um, is an expert in both the science and the art of church. Yeah, you know, that's good. And that's and where I really. Yeah, it's it's like, uh, you know, that's the the impression I had because I've been part of a church planning movement for seven years, but we couldn't get beyond 70 people because we just, you know, had this like mentality that we knew it all and we we're just going to go back to the Bible. And Wimber broke it down in a way that I just thought was phenomenal. So tell us about sort of how you connected to Wimber personally and how you ended up coming on to that board of directors for the whole movement. That was really interesting. Um my life and Randy Clark's are deeply intertwined. Randy's from about 150 miles south of me in Illinois. Yeah. Uh, we were in the same, we kind of entered the vineyard at the same time. He had the famous Spiller Town meeting. And uh, Randy was actually appointed to be sort of the leader of the Midwest. Well, if you know Randy, Randy's an evangelist and he doesn't really want to be bothered with leadership. Uh, he's not a bad leader, but it just wasn't his wheelhouse. So he goes to John and says, Happy's a better overseer than me, so let's trade places. So I ironically became Randy's leader. Wow. And then um, I, I didn't know. Um, I, I, it was a friend of Wimber's, but not close. We lived 2,000 miles away, and he had California friends. <laughs> the strangest story happened in, 2000, in 19, no, in uh, yeah, 1990. We're in a meeting in Chicago, and he comes up to Diane and I and says, I need to take you to lunch. And he said, as such, he said, God told God me, told me that's a strange statement for you. God told me to meet you. Happy and happy must be like, 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 my story. Hey, hold on, happy. Happy, you're getting a Hold on, can I pause you for a second? You're getting a little bit of a weird feedback in your in your computer audio. Are you okay, hearing now, that? Yeah, yeah, I don't hear it, but do you hear it now? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, Jordan, can you come online and help us with this, please? Jordan? Yeah. Hi, Jordan. Hey, everybody. So what are you hearing? 
Are you hearing yeah, it? Yeah. How about how, how about we just um, happy if you could just log out and log back in, and Michael, maybe you could talk about the e course. Yeah. For a okay. Yeah. Let me do that. Yeah. Sorry, everybody, for this uh, interruption, but technical challenges are such that uh, we need to do that. But I still want to hear happy story as he connected with Wimber. But yeah. So as we as we um, are pausing now for a little bit of technical cleanup, um, let me just say that we are launching an e-course on what we call Kingdom Leadership Foundations. And the Kingdom Leadership Foundations are just amazing uh, a set of tools on the sort of the foundational understanding of leadership and how leadership occurs. And so um, this course has got incredible notes. It's really connected in a powerful way to leadership principles. And in fact, some of the original inspiration for this course came from John Wimber. Um, you know, I really, I believe he was my primary mentor in terms of leadership concepts and leadership ability. And so a lot of what you're going to be receiving from this particular podcast with the happy actually is, is born out in the content that is in our e-course. So please check it out. And, uh, now happy's back. So keep, keep the story going. Okay. Did I sound better? Yeah, you do. Okay. So John says, to me, he says, Happy, God told me to ask you to be my personal advisor for the next 10 years. Wow. I'm absolutely blown away. What am I supposed to say? Yes or no? Or, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I don't know what I can offer that you need from me. I flew to California three days a month. He would pay my plane trip. He didn't pay me for coming. Uh, the time for the coming, uh, that was volunteer, but he paid my way out, paid my expenses three days. I meet with him personally or sometimes with Ken Gullickson. And we work through various issues of the vineyard. And wow. it was supposed to be 10 years. He said, I want to reorganize the vineyard from top to bottom. And I've often wondered what he really wanted to do because at about just a little less than two years, his health was deteriorating and he ended the relationship. Mm. Um, and we never got near what he wanted to do. I think he wanted to press us into some things I've gotten into in the last 10 years. We can talk about those later, but uh, we were mostly caught up with how do you organize a growing movement? And most people have to reorganize about every two to three years as fast as we were yeah. growing. So we spent most of our time there. But he would tell me things that were just precious. And uh, no. it was a little bit like, uh, I'm not ascribing John Wimber to King Saul, but it was a little like King da or young King David getting to spend time in the castle before he became king, learning wow. how kings live. Wow. And it's an experience that um, was indelible. But after that, and in that experience, um, we did a lot of reorganization work in that first year, and he put me on the board at that time. Wow. And I'm probably, John Wimber didn't raise up a lot of leaders, but he raised up spiritual sons in, in several areas. He raised up Randy Clark and Blaine Cook in ministry. He raised up me in planning. He mm -hmm. raised up... Um, I like Nicholson did a lot of conferencing with him. Rich Nathan did a lot of writing for him. Of course, mm -hmm. Todd Hunter and Lance did a lot of, uh, they succeeded him in various positions. So he had like leaders and he would train us in one area. We weren't, you know, generalists. We were very specific. Yeah. Wow. So tell me kind of, you know, your original sort of early impressions of Wimber. What did you see about him that that made him such an amazing pivotal leader? I mean, if we look back over the last 50, 60 years of the church, there's probably very few leaders that have had the pivotal influence that he's had, not just in terms of the charismatic world, but also in terms of general Christianity. I mean, he was a unique contributor to where the body of Christ is today. What would you say were maybe three to five of the key aspects of his nature and character that kind of uh, made him that amazing influential leader? Uh, you know, timing is a big deal. Yeah. The charismatic movement had kind of run out of energy. Uh, we were in the kind of name and claim it movement. When we heard Wimber, he sounded like a breath of fresh air. Yes. But he was doing signs and wonders. That magazine article was incredible. The whole magazine was dedicated to MC 510 and John Wimber and the vineyard and all that. And my wife looks at and says, these guys are doing better than we're doing. So we were naturally attracted to the moving of the spirit. 
And yes. John Wimber had the ability to convince the average person, I consider myself totally average at that point, that I could actually do this stuff. I had bought in, before I met John, to John 14, 12, that we'll do the same in greater works. Well, yeah. John said that we could do it, and he was showing people how to do it. And exactly. it was working. And yeah. I, I look at my life, a lot of the young businessmen in town, I'm in late 20s, early 30s, I'm making this transition. They think I'm an idiot. Give me wow. a, a nice career to go do this. But it hooked me. And I realize now it was the grace of God. But John had on him a magnetic pull that people wanted to be near him because they thought it would improve them and let them do the stuff. Wow. And of course, who doesn't want to do the stuff? So uh, that was it. As I look back, I also see that he was not just improving little bits of things. He was changing the paradigm of how we do Christianity. That's right. And I don't know any, I, I've seen a lot of tweakers in the U.S., but he is one of the few paradigm changers. I, I was telling you earlier yeah. that he and Bill Hybels, Hybels changed the paradigm about the seekers coming yes. in. Yes. And Wimber changed it about the spirit coming in. It's my yeah. theory that to this day, most modern churches have, if the spectrum is spirit and seeker, most of them have some, they're in between there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Now, this vineyard has some seeker in it, and the, certainly the seeker churches have some spirit in them. But I'm talking yeah. how much you push the pedal. That's so those right. things were attractive. And then Wimber would just, his old lines about not being religious. I'm a fat man on my way to heaven. Yeah. Well, he's fat and he's doing this. He doesn't seem too unusual to me. Yes. He was running away from God. And so he, he inspired and people say, if he can do it, I think I can do it. That's right. And sometimes we look at powerful leaders and we think, um, wow, they're so far beyond me. I don't think I could ever be like yeah. him. But you kind of felt you could be like him. So yeah. those things were all wrapped up. The timing was right. The spirit was right. Uh, the fact that uh, he, he, he was just wildly popular. Yes. It is remarkable to me, he could call a meeting in a city and fill the auditorium, whatever size it was. Sure. Today, we don't have a single vineyard leader that could go to a random city and fill an auditorium. That's and true. What did we do that we didn't wow. catch what he had? What what yeah. ethos and mannerisms did we lose? Right. But we lost something somewhere. Yeah, let's let's uh, you know clarify a few points too, because you may be listening to this uh, as a as a viewer and uh, not really know what MC five ten is. Well, first of all, MC five ten was a course that Wimber offered at Fuller Seminary. MC stands for Missions Course. Five ten was just the number of the course, and so he had been working with Peter Wagner. He had. Uh, you know, his original story was that he was actually the, the lead musician for the Righteous Brothers. You know, you never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. Okay. Well, he got saved out of that world being a, a lounge lizard in uh, Las Vegas, basically, and uh, joined the, the Quaker movement, actually uh, the Friends movement. And uh, took over the church that he was saved into, and it, and it grew massively. And then he was, you know, identified as somebody who knew how to grow churches. So he was invited to be the president of the Fuller Institute of Church Growth, which was an amazing opportunity for him. This is before he actually even had uh, what we know of as a, a full encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so this, you know, he he served in these ways. And then he was kept on as an adjunct professor and taught this course on signs and wonders. And what was interesting also, because you mentioned a few things, like he had this magnetism. He also had this leadership ability. He also could articulate what, what was mostly like mystical kind of complex ideas and, and do it in a way that, that made us feel empowered. And um, the other thing that he did as well, which I thought was interesting, was he approached the Holy Spirit ministry from a more standard evangelical perspective rather than a Pentecostal perspective. So he made it accessible to Baptists and to uh, Presbyterians and to Methodists, as opposed to, you know, uh, just going full swing into a Pentecostal theology and practice. Do you have any thoughts about that aspect? That's interesting because I mentioned Randy Clark. Randy, for those of you who don't know, of course, is a great evangelist, a former Vineyard mm -hmm. member until the year 2000. Um, yeah. Randy felt called to the Pentecostal world. 
Wow. And John and he would have long discussions. John really felt strongly he was to help the evangelical world figure it out. Uh, Michael, you may remember what he called the little vineyard man, the little fat man he used to yeah. draw. Yeah. He, he, for those of you that are simply uh, listening to, to us, he would draw a little stick man with two skinny feet and then a little fat tummy and two arms sticking up and put a head on. He would say, we stand on the word of God and we interpret the word through the kingdom lens. And the yeah. legs were worship and ministry. Yeah. And the, the body was the body ministry. And then he had two arms. One arm was church planning. That was our evangelistic side. The other was church renewal. That's how strongly he felt about it. He, yeah. he said those two are equal. Yeah. And he believed the ministry of the vineyard was to bring the things of the spirit to the evangelical world. So he always mm. positioned himself to be in good standing with evangelicals more than with Pentecostals and got him in a little bit of hot water yeah. um, over and over. And um, I had been from the charismatic side, so um, I could kind of see what he was doing, but it was, he, he was wise as a Fox in his generation because that's where they were. And mm -hmm. he needed to introduce that kind of language gently, slowly, carefully. And he did so. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you just mentioned <clears throat> was his commitment to renewing the church, especially the more mainstream, mainline churches, and then also planting new churches. But somehow that kind of clashed a little bit as well. I understand in, in Germany, for instance, or in the UK, that, that maybe set the, the, those two things were a little bit in conflict with each other. Because, you know, churches would invite him in to bring a renewal, but then he'd plant a church and sometimes take some people from the church. Can you, you were on the inside of a lot of that. How did you perceive it? You know, in the early days of the vineyard, which had been the 80s, we went to the UK with huge teams. Yeah. We would take 100, 200. You might have been on some of them. Um, but once we released John and Ellie Mumford to start church, doing churches john wimber said it would be unfair for us to go and do conferences mm. at the same time we're trying to launch churches now yeah. i'm not trying to put words in bill johnson's mouth but historically i have heard i've just only i've heard that he chose not to plant churches so he could go wherever he wanted to go yeah. and be a renewal agent so those are two different philosophies and of course john greatly influenced bill johnson um, sure I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong. Yeah. Uh, I do believe, I I do lean to what Billy Graham once said. He said he wishes he would have started more churches because mm -hmm. people soon lose what they catch just from a renewal meeting. Again, that's not a critical statement of any of the men right. I've talked about. You got to do what God tells you to do. But yeah. Wimber was adamant that he would not do renewal meetings um, if it would hurt the countries he was going to. Ironically, that must not have applied to America because he kept doing <laughs> renewal meetings here and planting church. That's right. And 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 again, you hear some of this, um, you know, I mean, everybody has a perspective on Wimber and how Wimber might have succeeded or failed or whatever. Uh, one thing I heard was that, you know, there, the conflict of that his, his, um, his church planting actually damaged his renewal meetings. Um, I know that in Germany, did, didn't he put a moratorium on planting for the first few years while he was doing renewal? So that, that was, yeah, that was his game plan. He said, you can't plant churches while I'm coming to your country. Once you start planting churches, I'm going to stop, stop coming. Yeah. And of course, all of John's great plans. I, I asked myself a lot, what would have happened to this guy? This guy dies at 63. Yeah. What? But he was unhealthy for at least the last five years of his life. Yes. So that's 58. Um, Nikki Gumbo just come out and said the healthiest or the most productive time of our life is 60 to 70. He was right. unproductive in any of his 60s. Right. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis what he could have been. Sure. I often wondered, what if he'd had a normal life of, say, to 80? Yeah. What, what would have changed? And, I know. Uh, how would have it changed my life? I obviously would have worked with him uh, the, all those 10 years. And uh, a lot of things could have been different, but he left too soon. It hurt the movement. It hurt uh, a lot of the dreams that he had. That's true. And yet still there's people like you and people like me 
who are still in our own way kind of carrying his legacy forward. I mean, I feel like most of what I'm doing in Pastor's Coach, I derive from Wimber. Most of what I teach from the, a kingdom perspective, I derive from Wimber. It's like, you know, again, his imprint on my life, even though I maybe had, you know, less than a half a dozen personal meetings with him, you know, and I was with him a hundred times in other other settings, obviously in group meetings. But, but um, you know, again, I know that just that impact is still carrying on through me. So let's let's go back again to the the board then because you were in some of the more challenging decisions that were made along the way. I know Wimber was reaching out to some more, let's say, traditional theologians. Uh, I know that he had included the, uh, the Kansas City prophets for a season. You know, there's a bunch of those, uh, in, you know, let's call them uh, seasons of Wimber's life where he went very experimental in certain ways, but he was also very careful theologically. So he would pull back from certain extreme, like I know even his relationship with, uh, with um, uh, Peter Wagner got strained over the issue of territorial spirits and spiritual mapping and things like that. Give me your perspective, having been in the board uh, around some of those different things that I just mentioned. Well, first of all, John started with a uh, philosophy that was like this, let a bush grow and I, after a while I'll trim it. Yes. That's a great philosophy if you're experimenting but it also got him in a lot of trouble. He would yeah. let things grow and then he would have to trim it. And then everybody would be upset. You trimmed it too far. You didn't trim it soon enough and, and all those things. So yes, I, I was on the board uh, during the prophetic years. And again, I think the vineyard, um, I have really strong opinions that the vineyard's assignment was to take things of the spirit and make them valuable to the rest of the world. Yes. So I think, and I'll get into Toronto later, but I think both the prophetic and Toronto were things, the prophetic was something God wanted the whole church world to know. We were supposed to process it, make it more palatable. Like Wimber could make anything palatable. He had yeah. people that didn't believe in it. They were cessationists up there praying for miracles. Right, like, exactly. Are we crazy? Yeah. How did you get that then? Uh, he'd say, come Holy Spirit, and the Spirit would roar through the room. We'd say it, and I'd think, where, where did the spirit go again? But, <laughs> but, um, and then Toronto, I think the renewal, the refreshing, the understanding that God is good, we were supposed to take that to the people. And we'll get more into that in a moment. But um, he, Wimber got hammered. You know, some people, these young people that want to be famous, they yeah. need to know Wimber paid dearly for being famous. You know, like these yeah. young people want a lot of Instagram followers or want to... <laughs> You know, his family was hammered. He was hammered. His health. I think he'd probably been more healthy if he hadn't been a pastor. I think those stresses. Uh, he had people barking at him from the left and the right. And yeah. uh, conservatives and Pentecostals. It wasn't fun to be John Wimber. In, yeah. the, in, the, in between the moments of glory, if you will, when you're speaking to 5,000 people. And then he had to put up with the other stuff. So, yeah, there was lots of up and downs. There was division on the board. Um, the board was a sounding board more than a powerful board. Yeah. And we were divided. Uh, myself was kind of one of the leaders of the charismatic. The, Let's try this stuff. It looks good to me. There were other guys who'd grown up evangelical, who had Bible degrees, who, oh, this looks really scary. Uh, from the beginning, Mike, I love Mike Bickle. He tried to hire me in 92 and it didn't work out. We said no. Oh. That's a long story. But he's been in my house and I've been in his place at times. And he was so Arminian and still is. And the vineyard is slightly cares, uh, Calvinist. Calvinistic, yeah. And, and just that alone was enough to get us in trouble. Yes. But nobody ever thought of those things. And, you know, we thought they would become like us and they thought we would become like them and nobody ever talked it through. It was my opinion, especially looking back, some of us suggested, but it never happened. It was my opinion. We should have sent one of our top leaders like a Bob Fulton or somebody else to live in Kansas City. Yeah. And say, let's work this out together because they had a real move of God. Yeah. Uh, and we just didn't quite know how to handle what was happening. Yeah. And so the board would fight about it. We fought more about Toronto than we did about 
the prophetic because the prophetic was so new. Most of the vineyard guys were shocked at. They didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. Now, Diane, uh, my Diane and I had been in Word of Faith people, and we'd seen lots of prophecies. So it was like, oh, you know, you don't change your life just because you're a prophecy. You say, okay, let me process this. Let me see what God's saying. And right. uh, a lot of people were really, they didn't know where to take it immediately, throw it out. So it was real, real interesting to be in the board meetings. And those were some great leaders I served with. Yes, yes. Now, uh, let's let's move towards Toronto for a minute, because obviously our ministry is an extension of uh, t- Toronto blessing of Catch the Fire. And obviously my devotion to John and Carol Arnott, who happen to have the same names as John and Carol of, uh, of Wimber, um, but John and Carol are not. We're just, you know, they're 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 still going strong at over 80 years old for for John. I'm just amazed at his travel schedule. I can't keep up with it. Um, but they've they've obviously had tremendous impact in the body of Christ, but also been quite controversial. Um, what was your take on the on the process leading up? What were some of the the reasoning and also some of the maybe uh, things that could have been handled better in the process. Do you have any thoughts about that? I'm probably the best person in the whole world you could ask that question to. So I'm overseeing Randy and I'm the regional overseer, which means I call meetings from time to time. And I call the meeting of all our pastors in the fall of 1993. And Randy calls me up and says, Hey, happy. I got some good stuff. Let me share. I said, no, I'm not going to let you share. He always wants to share. But he, I'll give you 10 minutes. He said, no, I need more. And he kept calling me for more. I said, okay, Randy, take the whole night. Wow. Randy shows up, and he had been to Rodney Howard Brown or somewhere and got the Laughing Revival. He prays for our region, 85 people. He writes it in his book. It's in several of his books. He wow. writes it in his book, and 82 of us are flat on the floor, including me. Then he writes mm-hmm. in his book and says, if happy known as Mr. Control is on the floor, this must be God. <laughs> so we had a great time. We came back to our churches. It lasted a couple of weeks. We didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So I'm out in Palm Springs in 1993 in the fall, November, about a month later at a vineyard regional meeting. And I think like you said, the council came in later or something. Yeah, so exactly. Arnott and I had been friends. I, I'm friends with lots of guys. I kind of, extrovert and just always talking. John and I are mm-hmm. friends. And John comes up and says, hey, Happy, I'm going to go to South America and I'm going to find God. I flippantly said, I don't know why you go to South America. Randy found God in St. Louis and he's got it. He's, <laughs> whatever you need, he's got Just call Randy. Well, I just said it kind of as a joke. John calls Randy and they agreed it They'll go up there on January 20th, 1994. Yeah. Oh, the meetings explode. And they call me within two days and say, Happy, you got to get up here. You started this thing. Get up and get it under control. I said, Oh, don't worry about it. It usually lasts two weeks because that's what had happened after the October experience. Sure, sure. And of course, what a prophet I was as it lasted <laughs> years and years and years and millions came. I eventually, I eventually went up. Uh, Diane said, I, I'm excited about it, um, but I'm not falling in the spirit like everybody else. So they had Diane test, you know, get up, give a little speech. In the middle of a speech, in the middle of a sentence, nobody near her, she collapsed and laid on the stage, the center stage for an hour. Wow. It was just kind of like God said, I'll fix your little wagon. Wow. But, so, um, I have been a fan of Toronto from the beginning. I have uh, had long talks with Randy about it. Uh, Randy and I are still dear friends. I got some guys this very week down in um, in uh, Brazil with him. We send people yeah. by every year. That's and, good. Uh, uh, I have been a fan. So when the controversy starts on the Vineyard Board, myself and another guy named Ron Allen, who was from Fort Wayne, we were yeah. the strongest defenders. And we kept trying to say, look, this is God. We need to give it some discipline. We need to work with it. We need to help them. Supposedly, I have no proof of this one. Supposedly, it was told to our board. We had told them to straighten up 75 times. Supposedly, John Arnott said he'd never heard one of them. 
So there's supposedly, there's a big difference there. Yeah. And he said, yeah. look, this, they're precious people. They're vineyard people. We authorize, now catch this. And this talking out of school here, but we authorized John to go up and talk to the, to John Ar- John Wimber to talk to John Arnett. And we thought it was going to be a talk. Yeah. And then as it's been reported, John, the first thing John Wimber says is you're out at the vineyard, basically. Yeah. And I think it stunned John Arnott. It stunned me. Uh, it showed up real quickly in Charisma and other places that the vineyard board had unanimously voted to kick them out. That never was true. And yeah. actually, trouble at the next board meeting i said who said we unanimously kicked them out and said you know we all agreed and it it pretty much we never really got to the bottom of it but some of us had not voted at all to kick them out wow some of us had wanted them to stay but work with the issues because the southern california guys with that hank hanagraph were getting beaten they were yeah. getting out. hank didn't broadcast into the midwest so yeah most of the Midwest people liked it and um, thought it was pretty good. Yeah, and Hendegraaff had taken over uh, Dr. Walter Martin's uh, uh, broadcast as well. And Hendegraaff also produced a book around that time for those who don't know who Hank Hendegraaff was. And uh, obviously, he was very much uh, sort of the early version of the heresy hunter. And um, and again, you know, I've, I listened to him many times. But I know that many of the things he published in his book, uh, you know, that he had actually sent a pre-copy to Todd Hunter. Todd said he reviewed it and pointed out a lot of mistakes, but unfortunately it had already gone to print. And so, but there was those kinds of controversial things. And then John MacArthur followed up and it was a tough time to be John Wimber. And it was a tough time also in the Vineyard movement as a whole. I know even a couple of the board members ended up actually, um, you know, going in the opposite direction almost, you know, uh, away from some of the early signs and wonders expressions and teachings. Some of them even reverted back to more of a, a Calvary Chapel type style of ministry uh, at the end of this time. And so it was a it was a tough season. So what what are some of your reflections on that time and how 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 did the movement come through? Because also simultaneously, Wimber's health was failing and ultimately he passed away. So. Give us your thoughts on that whole period. Well, I, I already alluded to his health. He was really in bad shape by 96. Yeah. And yeah. in 97, he didn't really do much anymore. Of course, passed away. Um, I think that played a role. Yeah. Um, have, have you read the new book, John Wimber, His Life and Ministry? I haven't gotten it yet, but I okay. was actually, I talked to the woman who wrote it, but yeah. Yeah, he get that cool. in there. She writes, I don't know that it's true or not. She writes that John told John Paul Jackson, a vineyard prophet, Kansas City prophet, that he felt he mishandled Kansas City. That's what she wrote. Uh, I could see both sides. Mishandled but Kansas City or Toronto? Which one? That he handled the, the Toronto thing in a, okay. inappropriately and should have been more patient. And, yeah. And probably uh, back to my comment I made earlier. I believe we should have sent a man or woman um, to go up and be our direct liaison. You don't get many opportunities like like those two. Those are two world-shaking events. We had a chance to be involved. Our job is to bring renewal. Uh, And my argument was uh, just because it's tough is no reason to separate. So we had to be the smarter ones. We had to be the parents, if you will. And... Uh, so the kids are running the, the insane asylum. Well, let's just get some control back in there, so to speak. Absolutely. So I, I would say that I would go on to say that of the people I saw, I know some people that were wonderfully touched. I, I would say a third of the people were wonderfully touched. Some of that third were profoundly touched, like Iris Ministries, yes. uh, the Bill Johnsons of the world. I mean, some of these guys. I was touched. I, I got a new image of God. Yeah. Um, I'd say about a third of the people came away. Oh, this is God, but it didn't do anything. And about a third of the people, it harmed them. Yeah. And harm is a relative term because some of them hated the stuff of the spirit. Some of them 
took words wrong. Some right. of them felt like God didn't love them because not enough happened to them. You know, the hard to receive group. Uh, yes. yes. It, it just, there was some weird stuff. Randy himself told me he knew there was some demonic stuff got involved, but he, he was hesitant to stop the demonic because he wasn't certain which was and which wasn't, but he didn't want to stop no. the good stuff. Right. And you could feel the pain in Randy's heart. He, yeah. He, he was sincere. John Arnott, to his credit, has kept his head high. Carol with yeah. him. Um, I've never heard him say a bad word. He and I are still friends, which I'm thankful. Yeah. In fact, I was at a ministry session with those two, and I was down in the spirit. And Carol sat beside me for three hours, and every time I started to get up, she would call for another wave. And so I, just, <laughs> I decided to just spot the well go to sleep. I'm not getting up, but she's around. She finally had to leave. And, yes. Uh, lifted. But, uh, they're wonderful people. Their stars yeah. will burn bright through history. And uh, Amen. The, Amen. The vineyard, I, I would say that that it is a, it is a one of the few defining moments of the vineyard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I call it the tummy ache of the vineyard, oh. and um, some of us survived it, and some changed the way they live. Yes. Uh, they they pulled away from the things of the spirit. Which takes us back to that Vineyard Man illustration I talked about. Yeah. I'm yeah. one of the few people that argue that Vineyard Man was the assignment of the Vineyard Movement. Mm. In 2024, unless we do our assignment, our lives are worth, are worth yes. nothing. Yes. So I argue that's a permanent assignment. Younger leaders and people who weren't there in those days argue that was Wimber's assignment. Uh. They're going to change. Yeah. And, well, there's been... Ever since John, there's been a fight for who the movement is. Right. That's interesting. Well, that's where I wanted to go with the next question was, <laughs> and uh, and you're probably a great person to uh, cover that with me. Is just you know where? Okay, so I stayed in the movement for three years after Wimber passed, and um, and again I had responsibilities. Although we had embraced Toronto and had 18 months, close to 18 months of nightly meetings six nights a week in a 1200 seat auditorium so we saw tens of thousands of people get touched on the west coast we also you know i also was loyal to wimber and and some of his mandates and and so and i had a responsibilities as a as a district overseer so i i stayed within the vineyard and we kept our friendship with john and carol arnott but you know had to navigate that because it was a little dicey at times okay but um Anyway, so we sort of followed Wimber on his path and then eventually realized that, you know, things had dried up a bit around us. And so probably the mid 2000s, I had a lunch with Randy and Randy said, well, I'd really, you know, you know, you got to know you're going to have messes when you go into a Holy Spirit dynamics. You can't you can't, you know, keep the stall clean and have an ox at the same time. You know, and so we, we chose to go back into a deeper experience and appreciation of the work of the holy spirit at that time now let me just um and that's even eventually how we ended up here in in redding california working with bethel church was um through that entire process but i was also tracking with todd hunter in the early days of his successorship and how that went you know the columbus accords and all of that how do you perceive that time and what could have been done differently to keep us let's say, focused on our original mandate instead of the drift that has happened over the last tw uh, 20 years? Well, I got a whole bunch of opinions. Okay. Uh, can't prove any of them. Yeah. You know, Todd, Todd Hunter was a, um, he kind of wanted to lead you by teaching you. He wanted you to read another book. Yeah. And he tried to help us understand the postmodern issues coming in. Uh, yeah. Burt Wagner was not really a Holy Spirit guy, but a nice leader for pulling the movement together. Mm -hmm. Phil Strout's not been a, none of the three leaders have been anywhere near the Holy Spirit focus that Wimber had. Yes. Um, partly their personality. Uh, they're a Hulk, three good men, They but they led differently. Um, so I sometimes look at my own life this particular church here at the, the vineyard of central Illinois or Champaign-Urbana, we have various names. Um, 
has been one of the strongholds of the Holy Spirit stuff because I, we were so powerfully touched from barrenness to fruitfulness and uh, the number of miracles that have happened here are stunning. But, uh, you know, if I look at the vineyard now, it's, it's somewhat fractured. You can find the group that is um, social justice has taken the front center. Mm -hmm. front center. Yes. Uh, diversity has taken front and center in some places spiritual formation yeah. has taken it uh, yeah. god loves all those things yeah um, the problem is um one time i i i drew a little six-sided diagram on one corner i put you could be a, a i put a start them all with s a scripture church you know like you just want to teach the bible right but other people it might be a seeker church you just want right. to come and bring it or you could have a spiritual formation church, a social justice right. church, a signs and wonders church, or it could just be a social club. A lot of churches out there are pretty much a social issue. Now, God right. likes all six of those things. Yeah. I hope all those are in your church. Yes. But if you try to emphasize all of them, you'll get none of them. Phil Stroud's famous for saying the eagle that chases two rabbits goes hungry. <laughs> he, he didn't come up with the line, but it, yeah. you know, this church would put would say we're going to pursue worship in signs and wonders yes that, we believe that was our original mandate uh i know the bigger there are several bigger vineyards that focus on social justice yes um, and the church picks that flavor up yeah now, i maintain this is again my theory but i maintain the hardest one of those things to keep going is the signs and wonders because it depends so much on the holy spirit yes yeah sadly i think if you were to divide the churches into camps i, I think maybe a third of the vineyard would believe that signs and wonders are the key focus mm. which is strange because when we started that was all anybody talked about yeah we wanted to worship but we thought that was just kind of our birthright yeah, exactly. We go do signs and wonders. Yeah. And we thought that would attract the world. And in fact, we're right here on the campus of the University of Illinois. It's a half a mile from here, 60,000 wow. students now. Wow. And everybody has philosophy. There's a part of the quadrangle in the center of the un university where people actually stand up and give speeches. It's usually they're radical. Um, yeah. But I, it makes you think of Mars Hill. And I wish we would stand up. And we don't do this, we should, but stand up and say, our God is a big, powerful God. Let me show you. There's a guy in a wheelchair. Why don't you get out of the wheelchair? Why don't you with crutches start walking? Right. right. So I think, it, I think it's still important. I think it's more important than ever in our generation that we have both word and works. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm not winning that battle in, in the movement. Yeah. No, I understand that. I mean, when I, I got to actually be pretty close to Peter Wagner for a couple of years in the early 2000s, and uh, and Peter uh, told me kind of candidly, he said, you know, when Todd Hunter came to him uh, after Wimber passed and said, what should I do with the movement? Uh, Todd's response was, you don't have a movement. You have four movements. Mm -hmm. And then he named them, and he says, I think you should appoint a leader over each one and turn them loose. In other words, he was much more sort of practically minded on those things. And I think, like you said, you know, an eagle that chases two rabbits, you know, we, we, we did fracture, unfortunately, after that time, the movement stayed together, but it's kind of like a sports team where the only thing that stays constant is the jersey. The players keep shifting, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to be loyal to a, a sports team anymore. I know. It's like, yeah, because yeah. he's the person. Well, and, and so, again, like, that's an interesting thing because I've always loved and, and continue to respect the vineyard. I felt like, uh, you know, my calling wasn't so much to the vineyard as much as it was to Wimber himself. Yeah. And when Wimber I, passed, I felt like, you know, my, my season with the vineyard had passed. I stayed for a couple way. more years, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I sometimes think the vineyard is like Samson's 300 foxes. Let me explain. We're way too little a movement to have had, as much influence as we've had around the world. Yes. So I see us as like these 300 foxes got our ties, tails tied together, lit on fire, and we went everywhere. And we've yeah. spread lots. We, we literally, in some ways, another illustration is Wimber's like a dandelion. It came up, 
was beautiful. Then he went into that white head that no yeah. seeds move around the world. We have influenced way more things than we should have. We have uh, probably look a little bit like we're stumbling yeah. at times. Because I like that idea that Wagner said about split into four movements. It, it might have been a good move at that point. The Catholics have those orders, you know, like the Order of the Franciscans. Mm -hmm. They care about this, and this order cares about this. We, we have at the highest levels argued that we should really care about or, you know, break into that. Yeah. But there's been a strong move to keep us as one unit. Yeah. The problem is the units start fighting and they start, my unit is more important than your unit. You know, yes. my, what we believe is really the gospel and what you believe is secondary. And this is, you know, you don't need to do this. As much. And there's no way I'll ever prove that. Yeah, we, that's right. With their opinions and opinions get yourself in a lot of trouble. That's right. Time, so. Yeah. Well, no. What's your relationship with the board of Vineyard now? Because uh, I know that it's taken on different forms over the years. And, uh, you know, so share you with know, us where things stand right now. What do you feel like your influence in the movement is and uh, so forth? Well, at one time, there were six of us major leaders that without our support, our large churches and everything, the Vineyard wouldn't have made it. Wow. So my wife and I are forever spiritual parents of the vineyard. We're not the leaders like John Wimber, but you know, we've poured thousands and millions of dollars into this thing. So yeah, and we did all of our leadership for nothing. Um, I ended my, I had three national roles. I was on the vineyard worship board and that ended 2018. I was on the national board till 2019. And I was the finance leader of the vineyard until 2020. Wow, and that's amazing. All those have ended uh, under the guise of I'm too old. It's white, what white hair does. I'm 74. And yeah. I, I understand they want a new movement. They want to do their things. Uh, they went almost entirely young, went out of our generation almost exclusively. There's a missing generation in the vineyard, and some of them are irritated, 55 to yeah. 70 in that area, right. maybe, uh, maybe 50 to 65. They, yeah. not many of them. So they went younger. I think Jay is the most, uh, maybe the strongest will leader we have. But the vineyard went from, in the days that I served on the board, we had a national leader, a national director. The national director was the national and a national coordinator. We had two paid men. Then we had a, some good assistants and stuff like that. But we really had two faces. Well, now they've reorganized and they have about anywhere from 10 to 12 fully paid leaders. They wow. figured out we could no longer run the movement uh, on a volunteer basis. And there's some truth in that. Uh, my daughter, who is now a regional leader here in the Midwest and runs this church, Julie and Mike Yoder, um, they look at me and they say, why did you give all that time and money? Um, I gave no less than 20% of my time every year. Wow. To movement. Wow. Uh, meetings and uh, oh, I oversaw 70 churches for a while. Now they're just paying people. Yeah. I don't. There were, we only give 3%. I suspect that's going to have to rise. I think Jay has got a tough job. When you add, when you go from a, going to a new job, add 10 new job assignments. Yes. And try to get them all being effective and working. I've noticed they bump into each other a little bit. Wow. They sometimes don't know their jobs. And, um, yeah. I, I wish him well. I want I had a young leader for a while who was also on the board. He was the youngest leader on the board. He used to look at me and say, don't you old guys screw this up because we want a good movement. Now I look at <laughs> young people and I say, don't screw it up because I want to grow old in this movement. I want my yeah. grandkids to be in this movement. Wow. But it's it's a challenge. It's an enormous challenge. Yeah. The diversity required, the um, – Boomers were a certain way, and you're probably a, a boomer, aren't you? I'm right on the edge, yeah, but yeah. Okay. So, 
boomers had, we thought we solved the world forever. We really messed the world up, but we thought we solved it. Now then you guys, or you're kind of one of us, but the next generation, particularly these younger people, they think we're crazy. They even have that crazy phrase and they say boomer. It's derogatory. Exactly. Yeah. We can't imagine that. Like, yeah. what do you mean? We solved these things for you. We got you into yes. work and into that and into this and that. But people don't get it. So I think these young people are going to have to learn what works. If I, if, if I had a word of advice to Jay, I would find guys like me who have some free time and I'd be draining us of every bit of knowledge we have. Exactly. There doesn't seem to be any desire to do that. So I'm um, content. I have a lot to say back here at the church. My daughter yeah. and son in law love me around. Um, Good. I'm the uh, chief connector. Bill Johnson told me something. I said to Bill, I said, what do I do? I, he said, well, are you a corporation or a business, you know, family? I said, well, we're a family. He said, well, you can't retire that. You can't just go hire somebody to take over. You can move up wow. to grandpa. And wow. he said, your job is to make sure that people that you yeah, raised up the 50 and above crowd love the love lady leaders. leaders. And so right. every Sunday, I'm a lawyer, lawyer, and I'm raising, raising, raising money. Being good okay. Guy. Slow down, because we're starting to get that same weird technical problem. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, 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 do you want to wrap yeah, it up? Why don't we, why don't we just call it, call it a, a close right now? Uh, there's so many more questions I have for you. Um, but why don't we do this? Um, let's close. And then I'd like to just, if you can come on for another 15 more minutes. And just uh, answer a couple more questions. We'll add it to this this particular podcast. Okay. So let me just close. God bless you guys. I'm so happy you've been with us. This has been a, a phenomenal uh, window into both, you know, happy layman's experience within the vineyard, but also the vineyard movement as a whole. We're so grateful for him coming on board and sharing with us. And we're going to add a little bit more to this in just a minute, but, um, you know, so please stay tuned if you can. But uh, anyway, I'm just going to wrap this particular podcast up right now, and then we'll have an addendum. All right. So Father, in the name of Jesus, bless everyone who's hearing our words today. And I pray that you pour out blessing on the Vineyard Movement as a whole, on Jay Pathak, the other leaders, Lord, that there would just be clarity and guidance into the future for the future of that ministry and all that you've done in and through that movement to bless the world. So we ask your grace in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So, um, so Jordan, what do you think we should do? Should we just close and reopen or can we just keep going? I'm still, I'm still hearing that weird problem. So I don't know what, what the situation is. Jordan, why don't you come online for a sec here? And uh, I know it's very unprofessional for us, but uh, any thoughts? Jordan? Yeah, he'll, he'll just come back on and we'll see if that if that okay. works. If it solves it. Okay, great. Yeah. Otherwise, we can just cut it at, at my prayer. Yeah. Thank you, live audience, for sticking with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, come back on. Technical problems. So anyway. You're back. How do I sound? You sound good now. Okay. Okay, great. Well, let me let me just ask you one other question that, that could take us an extra 10 minutes or so is where do you see the body of Christ going? Not just vineyard, but the whole the whole shebang, you know, because you've had a unique vantage point being in one of the most significant movements of the last 50 years. And having really ridden that thing, um, you know, from the closest perspective. And uh, I just want to know, what do you see for the body of Christ around the world? Where do you see it going? Well, I always start with the thing that Jesus never met a people he couldn't win. Yeah. And I have to remind myself that over and over because on the surface, it looks really bleak. Second of all, Alan Scott, who I was a close friend with for a while, and I'm, we've kind of drawn apart. I still like Alan, but he used to say, why are you complaining about your city and what's happening? There's more of the kingdom today than there was yesterday. 
God's got a plan for you, your city, tie into what God's doing, even in the middle of chaos. And I think that's great advice. So I, I would start there. Just in a practical sense, I think we're gonna, if we run our church as well, we're going to be needed more in the future than we're needed now. Mm. People's ability to handle stress, loneliness, issues, poverty, whatever it is, sickness, it, it's coming to an end. Um, suicides are way up. The depression medicines are way up. Yeah. Um, the, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. And I just think if we run church right, a place that's loving and kind and community oriented, talking about the power and presence of God, I think some churches could explode in a good way. Yeah. I think people aren't going to come to the old days of, uh, you know, rules, regulations. In 2012, Todd White came through here by accident. That's a whole story. But he opened my eyes to the identity message. You see, yeah. if, you, if you go back to Toronto, they were trying to begin to open our eyes to identity that God is good. The vineyard left before we knew that mess. We thought God just wanted us happy. Yeah. He wanted us to see God was good. Then Bill Johnson gets famous because he says there's sonship, identity. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, we're children of God. Uh, and then if you go further, if you go further, uh, and you really begin to understand who you are and what who Christ is, we have an amazing thing. I developed a little phrase that I should patent it, that Jesus is bigger, better, and more beautiful than you ever dreamed. Amen. He's bigger in the sense that we have Jesus about 10 foot tall and about 80 to 100 years old. He's strong as Superman. Wait a minute. The whole universe, all things are in Christ. So the universe Amen. is in Christ. Yet he's little enough, he lives in you and me. Wow. It's better than we ever dreamed because he's done everything. Yeah. Uh, this isn't a, the book isn't about us. Tim Keller wrote the phrase, the Bible is not a book about you finding God. It's the story of how God found you. Yet most Christians are still living the old covenant versus the new covenant. Yeah. Still more concerned about, concerned about their sins than their savior. And then yeah. I realized this thing's more beautiful because it's so stunningly good. Who would have thought of it? Yes. Right in the middle of yes. Satan's world, he builds this whole army. And it just, I believe if we really do the things we say we can do, we stop living hypocritical ourselves. I hate this stuff about uh, pastor, this is cheating here, or he's a right. Right. I hate that stuff. We ought to be above reproach. We ought to be somebody who everybody wants is jealous of, and yeah. we ought to have uh, things really rolling. So, I see a good future for the church simply because Jesus sees a good future for the church. Yeah. He doesn't see this thing ending in a bad way. And I'm not some uh, triumphalist that just thinks everything's good, but I do think we have to change our attitude. Yes. We are the ones sent to change the world. You yeah. know, God co-creates with us. He rarely changes the world. He, he gives us the power and the authority and the right. And so that's what I want to give my life to. That's a little different answer probably than you thought. No, no, I feel like it. it, it is. I think it is the hope of the future for sure. Um, you know, obviously I'm troubled by the lack of influence we seem to have at this moment in terms of speaking into education or, or Hollywood or whatever. But I do absolutely affirm what you're saying. You know, I tend to, when people ask me my eschatology, I always say, um, I'm an Isaiah 60 guy, you know, <laughs> arise and shine for your light has come. Gross darkness covers the earth, but the Lord shall arise upon you. And I just do feel like this, this hope that you're talking about is the hope that we need to be treasuring. I guess the challenge for me also is just the, um, and this is one aspect of the supernatural that I, I treasure, but I also feel like has been a little bit challenging for us. And that is that we, that we don't measure like we ought to. And uh, something happened in the heavenlies, but nothing happened on the earth, you know, and, uh, and you as with an MBA, you know, obviously you're a, you're a measurement guy, 
Um, how do you see the church moving more towards um, the kind of clarity that most businesses have to be walking in or they'd be out of business? In other words, how do we, if our, if our main job is to make disciples who make disciples, how's business? You know, t- talk to that a little bit. You know, tell me your yeah. thoughts on you how like we clearly... I'm sorry, go ahead. You sound like John Wimber. Yeah, exactly. He was always saying to us, what business are you in and how's business? Right. And uh, he would say pastors are the some of the most dishonest folks around it. And his dishonesty was like, how you doing today, Michael? Oh, we're doing great. Praise Church God. Yeah. And, everything. and two weeks later, the guy shuts his doors. And so there's a lot of that evangelistically speaking among exactly. pastors. I think we simply need to be honest. I, I haven't been, I'm not the greatest speaker. I'm not the greatest at any, but if, on all surveys, the number one thing they like about me is I'm totally honest and they believe I'll be integrous with them. Wow. I believe leaders need to have a high degree of honesty and commitment. Uh, if you do something dumb, admit it. And people don't care if you make mistakes. They care if you're not honest. Wow. Uh, you know, I famous old assembly God guy said, if a pastor will uh, apologize twice a year and keep his job forever. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, and, and we make plenty of mistakes. I, I have an MBA in finance and I've made mistakes with money in the church. And uh, I yeah. haven't helped some of these guys who don't understand finances. Yeah, I, I don't understand a lot of things in life. So I don't expect everybody to be good financially. So, what God's looking for is authentic people who really have the spirit changing their lives and that people look at us and say, what's going on with you? I want what you've got. You live in peace. You live in prosperity. In fact, the word that I love is shalom. We don't use it much. Yeah. The Jewish word meaning everything is in good order. Yeah. I hate the guys, the Chris, I don't hate them personally. I don't like to see a Christian car that's really old with all the Christian bumper stickers on it. God's my source. God supplies on it. Doesn't look like it. And <laughs> we, we need to be honest. Our prophets need to be honest. I, you know, we, we had to clean up a bunch of the bad prophecy stuff that happened over the last presidential election. That's so and true. I don't mind. I don't even mind prophets missing it. Just come out and say, you know, I was just out to lunch that day. Um, wow. And, and honesty, people are desperate for good answers. They're desperate to hang around good people. They're desperate for a solution to run through the maze we live in. There are yeah. no answers. Out. This stuff with kids changing sexuality and stuff, that'll work for a year or two. And then they're right back to the same problem that they changed over. Right. Um you know, people think, well, if I get rich, I'll... I used to work with the rich in my secular career. They're as messed up as the poor. Absolutely. And and yeah. so all roads lead back to Jesus as the only rock that doesn't move. Wow. And with Jesus being the centerpiece, it's like, wake up. Are you just having a bad day or are you always this dumb? <laughs> it kind of reminds me of uh, Andrew Womack. He has that famous line of be preaching line. He said, uh, how can you be so dumb and still be breathing? <laughs> of course, I can't get by saying that. He has that southern drawl. Yeah, um, exactly. But no, so I, do believe, I do believe the church has to push into an area of grace, righteousness, identity, and become new covenant people versus old covenant most people are still living with tremendous guilt on their sin. Yeah. And our sins were taken care of. Now we got to live in relationship. Absolutely. People are still struggling with that. And we, we preach double messages like God will love you. If you clean up, no, God loves you. And that's why he cleaned you up. Right. Uh, Go make something of yourself. Amen. So uh, even in the vineyard, we fight over, uh, you know, we, we've had some pushback. We really push hard on, you know, we have a righteous identity. We're righteous people. We don't have two natures. And in the vineyard, right. you can get some fights on that. Sure. Yeah, and no, it's, like, that. it's like, hey, come on. If we're going to have a message that's really good news, tell me what it is. Yes. Make it as good as the name. Yes. And then just become a radical, 
uh, or a raving uh, fan of, of the message, live it out. And I think we can win lots of people to the Lord. Amen. That's so good. Well, could you, as we close, can you just pray for the people listening to this podcast? And can you just sure. release a blessing on all of us? Because because what you're saying right now is is what we need. We need that honesty. We need authenticity. And we need to also embrace the reality of what Jesus has fully accomplished on our behalf so that we can walk in the freedom that he has purchased for us. So sure. pray for us. All right. Well, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to share with all my friends new friends today and Thank i pray you. that you open the eyes of their heart to see the goodness that you really have provided who you are and who we are and lord drill that into us then help us to live it out lord yeah. our world's a mess and our marketplace is expanding by the hour in, in many mm -hmm. ways kids don't know what to do parents don't know what to do old people don't know what to do lord i'm asking that you make us warriors of divine stature that are able to do amazing things transform lives bring souls into the kingdom build them up into disciples lord i, I want to thank you for what you did for our world through john and carol i bless them yes uh, many more good years and to sail on into their reward in great health and great joy yes. and be able to look around and say lord uh, you did this, and we thank you for using us. Lord, I, I thank you for the team that put this on and all their work they're doing, a building of things. Lord, we need men and women like Michael and his team to be everywhere, training, teaching. Lord, expand that. Those of you, those of you listening to me, become uh, resources of the people around you. Lord, show them the purposes you have for their lives. Show them how to be fruitful and how to partner with you so that they'll fulfill the destiny on their lives. Yes. Lord, you're the best. Thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One final Amen. word I would say. Sure. I often tell people there's only two things you need to answer in all of life. Paul asked them on the way to Damascus, who is God? Who are you? Spend your life figuring those two out. It'll change your world. Hallelujah. I received that. All right. Well, bless you guys. And so grateful to have you on this podcast. Take care, everyone. God bless.